today I want to talk with you about my experience with Michelle Thomas. I was with Michelle Thomas for about 10 years and I specifically was studying his way of being able to teach, his method, the Michelle Thomas method. And as far as I know, I'm the only person he ever taught us to. Now, initially, when I met Michelle Thomas, I was somebody who didn't believe I could really learn to communicate well in a foreign language. Like some of you, at the very beginning, you know, I had studied languages in schools and different places where I never really learned to communicate as a result of all of that study. So one day I received a magazine in the mail, the Jerusalem Report, and it was the issue of August 11th, 1994. There was an article in this magazine entitled The Language Master. And since I had been fascinated with languages ever since I was a young boy, I began to read it and I was shocked to discover that this was a story about a man, a teacher, Michelle Thomas, who claimed to be able to teach anybody to communicate in a foreign language in a week or two. Now, frankly, this seemed crazy. I had never heard of such a claim by anybody, but I read the article more and it said that he was a Polish Jewish man who during the war had been in concentration camps, lost his family after the war came to the United States and he taught foreign languages in California to make a living. They gave some names of people who had studied with him. One of them was a woman at the European Institute in Washington, DC. I immediately got on the phone and I called her and I said, you're mentioned in the article about Michelle Thomas. Is it true that he taught you two languages? in record time. She said, yes, he taught me French and he taught me German. Had you ever studied them before? No, not really. And what was the result? After one week of studying with Michelle Thomas at his center in New York City on Fifth Avenue, I was able to do a live television broadcast in French, in France, with no editing, nothing, it was totally live and I was totally comfortable and I was absolutely able to express myself in complicated topics. And I also learned German from him and was able to do other things like that. And I was kind of amazed. And there was another person also who was mentioned and I contacted that person and I realized, you know, I think this is for real. I think this guy actually has been able to do what he claims he can do, which is to teach a language to a non-speaker in a record time. It's said in the article that he didn't want to share how he did this with others. And at this point, he was already around 80. And I thought to myself, well, I really would like to learn what he does if for no other reason than out of my own personal curiosity, and maybe I too can use this method to learn languages. So what I did was I sat down and I wrote him a letter. Now I'm a physician and I wrote it on my letterhead. And because it mentioned that he was Jewish, I included some words in Hebrew and Yiddish. I thought that might get his attention. And then I waited and nothing happened. After about a month, my secretary, as I was coming out of the treatment room, the I was saying patients, she said, oh, by the way, there's someone calling from the office of a man in New York, Michelle Thomas. Do you want me to take a message? I said, no, don't take a message. I want to talk to them right now. Don't hang up. I rushed to the phone and it was, Michelle Thomas's secretary. 
She said, Mr. Thomas has received your letter and he would like to speak with you. I thought, great. I made an appointment and I spoke with him. It was very nice, very easygoing. And I later found out that he was actually feeling me out. He was reading me because he was an intelligence officer during the war. And finally, after we talked for a while, he said, why don't you come to New York and we'll meet and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. So I said, fine. I made an appointment to come on a Sunday morning to his office at 156 Fifth Avenue in New York City. Now, I was so excited that this was happening that I actually came on Saturday. I didn't want to even have the possibility of anything going wrong. And on Sunday morning, I took the bus in from where I was staying and I camped out at his door. I literally was sitting in this empty office building, Fifth Avenue. Now, New York City in those days on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning is deserted. There was maybe one or maybe two people in the building downstairs. I had to sign in. But I went upstairs, our appointment was for 11, and I waited. He never came. I was so bummed, I was miserable. I had made this long trip, I had written this letter, everything else, and the guy never shows up. But luckily, I had asked him for his personal phone number. This was a time when people gave out personal phone numbers. This was before cell phones. And so what happened was, he answers the phone. Now, Michelle Thomas was a night owl, so he was used to staying up late and sleeping into the morning. And I told him, hi, my name is Harold Goodman. He said, who are you? I don't know you. And I said, actually, Mr. Thomas, you do know me because you made an appointment to meet with me today in your office. He said, oh, shit which by the way, in 10 years was the only time I ever saw him lose his cool. He said, don't go anywhere, like I'm gonna go somewhere. And he said, wait for me. And I waited for him and a taxi pulls up, screeches, and the door is thrown open. And this short guy who has water dripping off of his hair, he obviously had gotten out of a shower, is running towards me. He said, you're Harold Goodman? I said, yeah. Had an enormous smile on his face. We shook hands. We went upstairs to his office. We talked for a while. And then he said, let's go for lunch. We went for lunch at a little restaurant nearby that he used to go to. As we're having lunch, he said to me, our waitress is Polish. And I said, oh, you're from Poland. You know Polish? He said, it's my native language. I said, why don't you speak Polish with her? And he said, since the war, I have never spoken Polish. Because of what was done to my family in Poland. However, it's also a good policy not to let people know any more than they need to know. Again, the intelligence officer coming through. And again, the man who survived three concentration camps. So he said, let's go back to my office. And we went up there. We had been talking all morning about what he does and so forth. And he told me basically what was written in the article, that the major thing about this method is to diffuse tension to get the student really relaxed. And that was it. But that didn't help me understand what he was doing and how he was doing it. And furthermore, you have to remember, this was before there were any courses available for public consumption, like the audio courses that are presently available. None of them were available at the time. I literally didn't know what this man was actually doing. I had no evidence of what he was doing. He told me he had tape record of lessons, but he wouldn't let me listen to them. 
we sat down in his office and he said, you know, the only way you're ever going to understand what I do is if I do it with you. I said, fine. And he said, I'll teach you a language. What language do you want to learn? I said, well, and before I could answer, he said, you want to learn Spanish? You want to learn French? He said, I'll teach you French. I had had a year of college French, many years previous to that, but I couldn't communicate in French. I, I couldn't hold a conversation. So I thought, sure, we'll do it. And we began, and he started to teach me French using his method. Now I must say that his method, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is to bring the student into the present moment. There's no testing, there's no writing, so there's no note taking, there's no textbook, there's no examinations, there is no pressure at all, no pressure. And I enjoyed myself. He would say something to me, and then based on what he said, he said, how do you say this in French? Well, he had just told me, so I said it back to him. And then he would say something else, and he said, well, this is the word for house. And you just learned how to say, I go to. So how would you say, I go to the house? I, I said, well, I, and I would say it in French. And then he would say, this is the word for theater in French, and so forth. Library, school. And how do you say, I go to the school, I go to the library, I go to the theater. I just repeat back what he had said. Over the space of five or six hours, I was being transformed. I was able to communicate in basic French. And he kept going on without any notes. He had no notes whatsoever. Didn't refer to anything. Every once in a while, I would say something and he would just pause for a moment and look at me. And I subsequently realized what he was doing is he was changing his strategy of teaching me based on the feedback, live feedback he was getting from me. No bathroom breaks. Finally, I said, I really have to go to the bathroom. So he nodded, I went to the bathroom, I came back. He just resumed exactly from where we were. And finally, it was getting late and I did have a train ticket to return to my home in Maryland, many hours away. And I told him and he said, we'll go in a cab together. I'll drop you off at the station and I'll go home and fine. Over the next 10 years that I continued to visit with him, interview him about his life, his work, it was always the same thing. We'd go all day Saturday, all day Sunday, break for lunch. If there was time for supper, we would have supper together. And then he would drop me off at the train station and I would go home. Over a period of 10 years, I learned a lot about his life but not so much about his method. The only thing I was getting from his method was what he was doing with me personally. He wouldn't comment on it. For a long time, he wouldn't really get into things like the methodology of how he put these lessons together, how he broke down a language and rebuilt it in order to teach it. But I began to figure it out. I began to consider what I had been taught and how it was taught. And on the train home, every time, I would take voluminous notes because he wouldn't allow me to record anything except his conversations about him and his past. One day I told him, I said, you know, I need to record the lessons that you're doing with me. And he said, no. And I said, why not? He said, because if you do that and analyze it, you'll figure out what I'm doing. And I said, 
well, why the hell do you think I've been coming here for the last six, seven, eight years? And he said, no. I said, okay. I got up and I walked out of the room and he ran after me. He said, come back. The only way I got anywhere with him over 10 years to figure out what he was doing was to call his bluff. To basically say, you refuse to cooperate with me, I refuse to cooperate with you. I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Well, I came back many, many, many times. And over a period of 10 years, I began to figure out not only what he was doing, how he was doing it, and how he was creating this whole thing in the first place. Now, some of you may wonder, well, how was he? So I'll tell you what I know. The first thing you have to understand is there are so many people who are trying to figure out how Michelle Thomas is able to achieve the miracles in teaching foreign languages that he does and he has. And basically it comes down to this. And for those of you who meditate, you know in meditation, you need to stay in the present moment. You need to stay in the now. That was central to his work. He would always keep the student in the now, the eternal now. Because in the now, everything is safe. You're comfortable in the now. You think about the future, will I remember this? What will happen? Or the past, well, I'm not so great at languages or I don't know how I'll remember this because I've forgotten in the past. No, you bring the student back to the present moment and you bring them back to the present moment constantly. Now there's some times where I would look for things like this, searching my memory, and he would quickly say, come back. You're not gonna find it up there. And I would come back. Some of our sessions lasted five or six hours without any breaks. And then in the afternoon, we would do many more hours until the evening, especially on Saturdays. He never got tired. And at the time, the man is in his 80s. But I got tired, and I sure wasn't in my 80s. In 2005, he died. And at that point, I had gotten most of what I wanted. I would figured out how he did what he did. I figured out also that what you need to do, besides keeping the student in the present moment, is to do everything possible to reduce any form of tension. And one of the ways you do that is you break apart the language and you reconstruct it in a way so that when you discuss it in the student's native language, say English, it's like having a conversation with a friend. Subsequently, what happened was after his death, Hodder and Stoughton, now Hodder and Arnold, approached me. Near the end of his life, he had been approached by them because BBC Two had a documentary called The Language Master, which the man who made it told me was directly taken from that article. Overnight, at that point, he became a sensation in the UK. The publishing company signed him up so that they would have some of his courses available, these famous courses that people had paid thousands of dollars participate in. I studied the courses. I got ideas of what he was doing, but basically I had a pretty good idea up to that point based on my own experience with him of what he was doing. But I had never replicated it. I had never done it. And then the publishing company, through a woman named Rose Hayden, who had worked intimately with him for many years, 
was told that I was the only person he ever taught this to. They approached me. They asked me to do a course in Mandarin. I said, I don't know Mandarin. And they said, you know the method. If you can figure out how to teach a course in Mandarin, according to this method, we'll give you a contract. I thought, a publisher coming to me, offering me a contract? I'd be crazy if I didn't do this. But I thought, how am I going to present a course in Mandarin when I don't know Mandarin? And I thought, you're a resourceful guy, make it happen. But what I did was I started studying all the resources I could find to, to learn Mandarin, spoken Mandarin. And I noticed they all had pitfalls. They all had problems. One of the problems was is that none of the students taking these courses were able to communicate in Mandarin. And I thought, well, that certainly is a lousy product. Imagine producing a product where you're going to teach somebody to communicate in a language and following the product they can't. Following use of the product, they're unable to communicate. And I thought, Michelle Thomas did much better than that, and so can I. So I studied all of these different courses. I broke it down to all the different patterns of Mandarin Chinese, spoken Mandarin Chinese. I figured out the basic number of vocabulary words and which ones they were because you know vocabulary and the most frequently used vocabulary varies by every single language so it was very different say with basic english by ogden which has 850 words in which he said and i think it's true that you can communicate up to 20,000 words with these 850 words you can communicate these concepts basic English, but you can't take that vocabulary of basic English and apply it to Mandarin or Russian or Tagalog. So I figured out what was necessary for Mandarin. And then I got a native Mandarin speaker, a highly educated woman from Beijing. And she was the person who did all of the talking on the courses. I wrote the course. She checked it over to make sure that it was accurate. And then we recorded it, and Jing Tao did all of the pronunciation in Chinese. Now, some of you may know, Mandarin, like some other Asian languages, <coughs> uses tones. So you have words in Mandarin, single syllable words, for example, and by changing the tone, it totally changes the meaning of the, the word. Now, Michelle Thomas had never taught a tonal language. But now I had to do that. I created an entirely new system for teaching tones, which was so successful that sometimes students in the pilot, pilot trainings that we did before the actual official recordings, they could remember the tone and not remember the meaning or the word. And I thought, I have actually discovered something that works really well. It could be applied to other tonal languages too, obviously. Anyway, we recorded the course, what was called the foundation level. They've since changed the names. And it was wildly successful, got incredible reviews, people writing. I went to China, people say, you know, we're impressed that you were able to communicate in Mandarin and your tones are so good. Then they asked me to do a mid-level course, an advanced course, and truly, these three courses I did are a single course, not multiple levels. Anyway, so what happened with Michelle Thomas is I realized he had figured out how people learn in the moment. And you don't have to remember anything any more than you have to remember what you had for breakfast this morning. If I ask you, what did you have for breakfast? You'll remember it. 
You weren't trying. There's no trying in the Michelle Thomas courses. You're just having a relaxed conversation with somebody. And that's the way it all happened. The most exciting thing in my experience with these 10 years with Michelle Thomas was when he was teaching me. He was teaching me French. And even though I had taken a year of college French, I could never have a conversation. I got very good grades, but I still couldn't have a conversation. And I would emerge from his office. And even though he told me, he said, don't practice, don't review, just even if you show up next time and you've forgotten everything we did, I won't be at all surprised. Of course, I would come back and I didn't forget anything. But the excitement that I could actually do something that I never believed I was capable of doing, and in such a simple and relaxed way, just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. And I kept saying to myself, this is the most amazing thing. I'm able to speak French. And I didn't do any homework. There's no textbook, there are no recordings, no practice, no examinations, just being with this man. Now over the last five months, every week, I've been doing the same thing with two of my nephews. I've been teaching them modern Hebrew. I'm developing a course a Michelle Thomas approach to learning modern Hebrew. And I happen to know modern Hebrew very well. And this course is just a pure pleasure for me to teach. Now, my nephews both have learning disabilities. One of them, in fact, the older of the two, they're in their 20s, has such severe dyslexia that he had to get special permission to do certain things while he was going through university. And he changed his major so that he wouldn't have to read too many books. And they tell me this is the highlight of their entire week. I never expected for my nephews who are just, you know, people who I never knew that well to be so excited about something that I'm doing with them. Truly, this approach is mind-boggling. It's mind-blowing. I invite every single one of you to be my student, to learn modern Hebrew with me. I want to share this amazing language, and I want you to be my student. I'm working on the course, and when it's done, it's going to be amazing. Thank you. Thank you.